Well, hey there, and welcome back to Highlanders History. Now, in this video, we're going to review every dang thing you need to know about Unit 2 of AP U.S. History. The time period is 1607 to 1754. Now, the major themes of this unit have to do with comparing the different motives and methods that Europeans used to colonize the Americas. So why don't you go ahead and crack open them brain folds, because I'm about to dump some learning into them. Let's get to it. Now, before we get started, just so you know, this video is part of a larger ultimate review packet for AP US History. It's got everything you need to get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. So if you're interested in something like that, link in description below. Okay, so the last unit dealt largely with the societal structures that were in the Americas before the Europeans showed up. And then we saw how the Europeans, namely the Spaniards, showed up kind of accidentally and got their conquistador on. And this unit is gonna deal with the Black Friday sale of all European colonialism in the Americas as the French and the Dutch and the British all begin clamoring to stake their claim in the Americas. But each of these European states implemented their colonial project just a little bit differently based on their colonial goals and their regional circumstances. So let's look at each of them. First, let's remind ourselves about how Spain colonized the Americas. Now we talked about this in Unit 1, but just for the sake of comparison, let's remind ourselves. The Spanish established colonies in the Americas in order to extract wealth, both in the form of valuable cash crops and the actual digging of gold and silver out of the ground. And they subjected the native population to this end. They tried with mixed success to convert them to Christianity and introduced a caste system that reorganized society based on racial ancestry. Okay, now let's have a look at how the French colonized the Americas. French colonial policies differed from the Spanish colonial policies because the French were more interested in trade than they were in conquest, especially the fish and fur trade. Compared to the Spanish and the English, of whom I will have more to say in just a moment, there were relatively few French people who showed up on the American shores. Now, despite the first permanent French settlement in Quebec, mostly the French established trading settlements around North America, and in order to further advance their economic goals, some French traders married American Indian wives, which kept kinship ties alive with some of their more significant native trading partners. I don't care who you are, that's romantic. Hey honey, I just want you to know that the last week has been the greatest week of my life, and there was nobody whom I would rather marry in order to firm up my trading relationship with your people than you. So, will you marry me? Is that a yes? Anybody understand this language? And yes, while these marriages may have been a little transactional for our taste, that doesn't mean that there wasn't some mutual benefit that occurred out of these alliances. For example, the French fostered some alliances with the Ojibwe Indians, and there was some mutual cultural exchange. The Indians benefited the French because they could prepare beaver skins for sale at market. And the French benefited the Indians by introducing iron cookware and manufactured cloth. All right, now let's look at the Dutch and their colonial goals. In 1609, the Dutch established a fur trading center on the Hudson River, which is in present day New York and their goals for colonizing were mainly economic, like the French. Now, the Dutch were altogether Protestant, but unlike the Spanish, they showed very little interest in converting the natives to Christianity. By 1624, they had established New Amsterdam, which facilitated and advanced their economic goals, and this became a hub of trade that attracted large populations of traders and merchants and fishermen and farmers. Okay, now we need to turn our attention to the British and their colonial project, and arguably it's the British and their colonial goals that are the most relevant for United States history. So first, let's Let's talk about the motivations for British colonization, and then we'll compare the different kinds of colonies that they set up on the eastern coast of North America. Now, economically during this period, Britain was, to put it mildly, a hot mess. The Columbian Exchange was changing the economy. Wars with France and the conquest of Ireland were costing them a fortune. And as a result of all that, inflation began to take hold of the British economy. If you don't know what inflation is, it just means that prices were rising, and that means their money was worthless. It just wouldn't buy as much. And this was particularly grievous to the noble class who could see their wealth vanishing before their eyes. Additionally, the lower classes were enduring hardship as well. The land which had always been available to them for farming was rapidly disappearing due to the enclosure movement. So, take all of that, put it in a pot, baby, you got a stew going. Therefore, the motivations pushing the British to colonize the Americas were new economic opportunities and lands on which they could seek those opportunities. And there were others in Britain who wanted to venture across the Atlantic in order to seek religious freedom and improved living conditions. And as it turns out, in America, they found what they were looking for. Okay, now let's look at each of the British colonial settlements in North America. And just for poops and giggles, let's start with the Chesapeake region. In 1607, the British established Jamestown, which was their first permanent colonial settlement in North America. The founding of the colony was financed by a newish economic model called a joint stock company. A joint stock company was a private business entity in which several different investors put money into a pot and then collected profits when the entity was successful. This is different than, say, in Spain, whose model for financing colonization was strict through the state. Anyway, that model of financing gives you some sense of what Jamestown was all about as a colony. <laughs> 
Jamestown was purely a profit-seeking venture. Colonists basically divided their time between searching for gold and silver and building military forts to defend the gold and silver that they did find. But the beginnings of that settlement, to put it mildly, were rough. In the first two years, disease and famine killed nearly half the settlers. It got so bad that some of them resorted to cannibalism just to survive. Ew. And by 1610, seven out of eight of the settlers were dead. So the cannibals were well fed. Sorry, too soon? Are we laughing about this yet? But in 1612, they stumbled upon a miracle. Colonist John Rolfe began experimenting with tobacco cultivation, and that led to a complete reversal of their fortunes. A huge influx of investment came when tobacco was found to be marketable. Now, I should say that most of the people doing the work on the cultivation of these crops were indentured servants, which was the major labor system in the colonies at that time. Now, indentured servants were just people who, in general, couldn't afford passage from Britain to the New World, and so they signed a labor contract that paid for that passage. And they agreed to work for usually seven years, and then and after that, they would go free. So as the demand for tobacco began to increase, there was a corresponding demand for the land on which to grow that tobacco. And when white folks needed more land, they had a habit of taking it from the native populations, and needless to say, that increased the tension between the two groups. This increasing encroachment on their land and the violence that came with it led Indians to retaliate and raid colonial farms. These raids, of course, infuriated the British settlers, and they appealed to their governor, William Berkeley, to send troops to keep them safe. And when Berkeley refused, we get a little event called Bacon's Rebellion. A settler named Nathaniel Bacon led angry poor farmers, including indentured servants, in an attack against the Indians and then turned their militia toward the plantations owned by Governor Berkeley. They burned plantations, did incredible amounts of damage, but ultimately the rebellion was squashed. Now the consequence of all of this is that the planter elites got a healthy dose of fear with respect to disgruntled indentured servants. And that made them want to stop leaning on the broken staff of indentured servitude and lean more heavily on African slavery. More on that later. All right, that's the Chesapeake region. Now let's talk about the New England colonies, which were a little bit north of the Chesapeake, and they were altogether different. In 1620, it was settled by pilgrims who migrated in family units in order to establish a society, not a profit-seeking enterprise. Their goals were bound up in their Christian religion, and they created family economies as farmers. Even though their goals were different, they still had a rough time like their brethren and sistren to the south. Fevers and disease killed about half the original settlers, but after a few years, they had established themselves a thriving colonial economy that included agriculture and commerce. All right, now let's turn our attention to the colonies in the British West Indies and the Southern Atlantic Coast colonies. In the 1620s, the British established permanent colonies in the Caribbean in places like St. Christopher, Barbados, and Nevis. There, the warm climate afforded them years year-round growing season. They grew tobacco, of course, because it was a staple cash crop, but by the 1630s, falling tobacco prices led to the introduction of a new crop, sugarcane. And sugarcane was wildly popular in Europe, and so the demand for it spiked. However, sugarcane is a very labor-intensive crop, and so along with the increase in demand for sugarcane came the increase in demand for African slaves to grow that sugarcane. The demand for enslaved people grew so much that by 1660 in Barbados, for example, the population on that island was more black than it was white. And Yet another result of all this was a stringent set of laws that were passed in order to govern the black population on the island. These laws defined enslaved people as property and governed every little detail of their lives. Now, the Carolina colonies were influenced by this system as they set up their own economy and labor system. Planters from the Caribbean migrated to South Carolina, for example, and sought to make a copy of the Caribbean system in the Carolinas. And that's exactly what they did. All right, now let's take a little jaunt up to the middle colonies and see what's going on there. In New York and New Jersey, there was a diverse population. It was on the sea and it was shot through with many rivers so that these colonies thrived on an export economy, mainly of cereal crops. And because of the success, there was this growing inequality between the classes. There was an emerging elite class that was mostly wealthy urban merchants. And there was a lower working class that was made up of laborers, orphans, widows, the unemployed, etc. And there was a significant population of enslaved Africans. Also in the middle colonies, we got Pennsylvania. It was founded by the Quaker and pacifist William Penn. And in this colony, religious freedom for all was recognized. And the land on which colonists farmed was obtained not by force from the Indians, but mainly by negotiation with them. Now, the governance in the colonies was unusually democratic during this time. Due to Britain being across the sea and generally letting the colonies do their own thing, the colonial leadership established self-governing structures. And let me give you some examples. First is the Mayflower Compact. Pilgrims signed this before they disembarked from their ship, the Mayflower, which organized their government on the model of a self-governing church congregation. The second is the House of Burgesses in Virginia. 
It was a representative assembly which could levy taxes and pass laws. And there are other examples of representative assemblies throughout the colonies, but what you really need to know about them is that where they did exist, they were dominated by the elite classes. New York assemblies were dominated by wealthy landlords. In the southern colonies, these assemblies were dominated by elite planters. Okay, so that's our survey of the different regions that the British colonized. But now we need to think about them as a whole entity with respect to their role in trade in the Atlantic trade system. In the late 17th and the early 18th centuries, trade truly became global. With the uptick of colonization in the Americas, a new Atlantic economy was developed as well. And one of the more significant manifestations of this was the triangular trade. And if you just had to guess, what shape do you think this trade route resembled? Uh, triangle. That's correct, me from that side of the screen. Merchant ships would follow a three-part journey on this trading route. Let's start in New England, where merchants would carry rum to West Africa, where they would trade it for enslaved people. Then the ships sailed the dreaded Middle Passage, in which their hulls were packed to a cruel and unhealthy measure with enslaved cargo. Eventually they made their landfall in the West Indies where they traded the slaves for sugarcane. Then they took that sugarcane right back up to New England where they sold the sugarcane which was made to use rum and the whole show started all over again. Okay, that's one aspect of how the Atlantic economy worked. But now let's pop the hood and see what made that baby tick. It was an economic system called mercantilism. Now, those who saw the world through this economic lens thought there was only a fixed amount of wealth in the world and since they measured wealth by gold and silver, technically they were correct. And each state's goal was to gain as much of that wealth as possible and the way that they did that was by maintaining what they called a favorable balance of trade which is to say more exports than imports. And that makes sense because if a nation is exporting goods, that means that gold and silver is coming in. Now, this mercantilist system relied heavily on establishing colonies because that's where the raw materials came from. And to that end, the British government tried to weave more tightly the center of the empire with the colonies of the empire. And one way they did this was through something called the Navigation Acts. This set of laws required merchants to engage in trade with English colonies and English-owned ships. Also, certain valuable trade items were required to pass exclusively through British ports where they could then be taxed. Now, this is going to cause some problems in the next period, but for now, we'll leave it there. The point is, this newly established Atlantic trade system changed the colonies. It generated massive wealth for the elites like merchants and investors and plantation owners. And it also turned America's seaports into thriving urban centers. Okay, that was trade in the new system. Now we need to turn our attention to slavery in the British colonies. Between 1700 and 1808, about 3 million enslaved Africans were carried on British ships across the Middle Passage. The majority of them were sold into the hands of planters in the British West Indies. But it's important for you to know that every British colony participated in the slave trade, mainly because of the extraordinary wealth they gained by coerced labor in the export economies dedicated to tobacco, sugarcane, and indigo. Now, comparatively, New England farmers held relatively few slaves. The Chesapeake and Southern colonies, on the other hand, held lots of slaves. In Virginia, following the Carolinas and Barbados, strict slave codes were introduced. And in these, slaves were defined as chattel, which is to say property. Additionally, slavery was turned into a perpetual institution that was handed down from one generation to the next. And they did this out of a desire to keep a more controlled and growing labor force. Because indentured servants and enslaved Native Americans simply could not supply the demand that they needed. However, it's going to be important for you to know that some enslaved blacks didn't just accept this system, they actually rebelled and resisted. And the resistance basically came in two different flavors. There was covert and there was overt. Among the strategies of the covert resistors were the insistence to secretly maintain cultural customs and belief systems from their homes. Homeland. Others broke tools, ruined stored seeds with moisture or faked illness. And among the strategies of the overt, I'll give you one significant example, the Stono Rebellion. This occurred in South Carolina in 1739. A small group of slaves stole weapons from a store and killed its owners, and then they marched along the Stono River and their numbers grew as they marched. Along the way, they burned plantations and killed white folks. The South Carolina militia finally confronted them and squashed the rebellion, but not before losing many of their own number. Okay, so the relationship between the colonists and the black population was a little bleak, but I'm sure the colonists have figured out by now how to make friends with the Indians. Yeah, no. Now in the last unit I mentioned the Pueblo revolt against the Spanish. And this led to the Spanish making some concessions to American Indian culture. And with the British, relations with the Indians wasn't much better. Case in point, Metacom's War in 1675, which the British called King Philip's War. So Metacom was the chief of the Wampanoag Indians, and the British called him King Philip. He began to see that the British encroachment on their ancestral lands would destroy their way of life, and therefore the British must be forced out. And so the Wampanoag allied themselves with other Indian groups and attacked white settlements throughout New England. They burned fields, killed men, and captured women and children. The British allied themselves with the Mohawk Indians, 
Indians who eventually ambushed and killed Metacom and the movement fizzled out. But the point is, all was not well between the British colonists and the Indians. Okay, now in the last section of this review, we need to talk about colonial society during that time and its structure. And let's start with religion. And if we're going to talk about religion, we need to start with the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a movement in Europe, especially among the elite, that emphasized rational thinking over tradition and religious revelation. In other words, people wanted to rely on their thinky-thinky parts at the expense of their believey-believey parts. Now, this movement took root in the colonies largely because of a robust transatlantic print culture. And that print culture spread the ideas of Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke and Voltaire and Immanuel Kant. Now, while this movement certainly undermined scriptural and religious authority, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, it did introduce to the colonies some ideas like natural rights. And the idea of natural rights is that people have inborn rights given to them by a creator and not by a government. There was also the idea that the best form of government involved checking and balancing power, and that the best way to achieve that was to split the government into three branches, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Additionally, the colonists encountered ideas like the social contract, which argued that people were in a contract with their government. Since the power to govern is in the people's hands, their job was to take some of that power and deliver it to the government. And in exchange, the government's job was then to protect the natural rights of the people. And if the government broke that contract, it was the people's right to overthrow that government. All right, now let's talk about the Enlightenment's attack on religious authority. A group of Christian colonial ministers who became known as New Light Clergy lamented the loss of faith engendered by the Enlightenment. And so they began to preach against such abandonment. They also emphasized the democratic principles of the Bible. They railed against the practice of elites buying pews in churches which were exclusively reserved for them. And as their work caught on, it led to a leveling out of society. And the work of these New Light preachers laid the groundwork for one of the most significant religious and social upheavals of that time, namely the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening was a massive religious revival that swept through all the colonies and generated intense Christian enthusiasm. And two notable leaders in this movement were Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. Edwards was a New England minister who preached in Northampton with the precision of a philosopher and the heart of an evangelist. And under his preaching, the revival began to catch, but it was only local at that point. It took the English itinerant evangelist George Whitfield to come make the fire spread. This fiery preacher traveled throughout all the colonies, preaching in churches and in open city squares and in fields and wherever he could gather people. The result of the Great Awakening was a large-scale return to the Christian faith and an experience that bound the colonists together. And many people point to the Great Awakening as the first vestiges of a true American identity and where the seeds were sown for the rejection of the British. So all that to say, the Great Awakening had a massive impact on political and social realities in the colonies. Now, also during this time, the colonies were experiencing a gradual Anglicanization which is to say they were becoming more English-like. They were developing autonomous political communities that looked very much like the political communities back in England. Even so, the colonists began experiencing a rising frustration with the British, and they began to resist. Now, all of that is going to be explored in its fullness in the next unit, but now I just need to give you an example of one of the practices that led to that growing mistrust between the colonists and England. And there's lots of examples that I could choose, but I'll just choose one, the practice of impressment. And impressment wasn't like, yo, man, that's a nice hat. Where'd you get that hat? No, impressment was the act of seizing using colonial men and then forcing them to serve in the Royal Navy. Now, England justified this practice because they needed soldiers for all their wars, and they needed colonial troops because, hey, this empire ain't gonna rule itself. Needless to say, colonial men, on the other hand, weren't big fans of the common experience of a Royal Navy sailor. There was plenty of malnutrition, disease, and death. And in 1747, a general impressment for King George's war led to three days of rioting and resistance in the colonies. And the important point is this. The colonies were becoming increasingly aware of their natural rights and were refusing to allow their natural rights to be violated by England. And that's what you need to know about Unit 2 of AP U.S. History. If you want help getting an A in your class and a 5 in your exam, you know what to do. Click that ultimate review packet and go get it. If you want to join the Heimler family and give me the signal that you want me to keep making these videos, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button and come along. Heimler out.